That was pretty extraordinary, wasn't it? It's truly amazing the gifts and talents that the Lord gives and entrusts to us as his kids. And so there's the CD. You can pick them up in the family room after service. Uh, if you pre-ordered, then you can kind of skip the, the line to buy it. It's the beauty of being ahead of yourself. And, uh, and you can pick it on up. So what I want to do for the next, oh, 20, 25 minutes is I want to have a family type of a meeting. If you notice on your bulletin, it says, I heart for. And the idea is, is that we have a heart for things. And so for a church to have a heart for things, it means that us as individuals need to have a heart. You guys realize that a church isn't necessarily a building, it's a group of people. And so in order for God to use a church and for a church to have a heart for something, we all need to have a heart for it. And I use, I like the I heart for, so it's three characters and I, my artistic side like that. But I also have, we have a heart for four different things too. So, so it, it works on multiple levels. Now, as we stand here today at the end of 2014, I'm going to be coming upon my, uh, my second year as the lead pastor here at Crossroads. And really internally as a church, as a church staff, we talked about the year 2013 as a year of transition. Pastor Bill Ritchie handing the leadership baton off to me, and then all the subsequent changes that we made. We literally in the in 2013, we reorganized the entire church. And for those of you who've been around for a while, you know that when you reorganize, it's really challenging. I was recently reading that in order to have a better future, it is impossible for it to happen without disrupting the present. Very fascinating quotation. In order to have a better future, that's impossible without disrupting the present. And what it means is that in order to do the things that you feel you need to do to make tomorrow better, you have to mess up some things today. And so the year 2013 was a huge year of transition for us at Crossroads. And then we moved into this year, 2014, and as a staff, we called this year a year of stabilization. That with all of the reorganization and changes that we've made, now, the year 2014 was about stabilizing, about getting adjusted to our new normal. And I'm here to tell you, as we're in the very last few weeks of 2014, that we've really seen that as a church. We, we're comfortable with the way that we're doing things differently than we used to do them. And we're calling 2015 the year that we're stepping into a year of imagination, where we're saying, God, because we've transitioned, because we've stabilized, Lord, now we're dreaming about who you have called us to be and how you want us to do what you're calling us to do, that we might, as a church family, step into all that you have for us in Christ. And as we, as a staff, are dreaming and imagining what it is that God would have for us, I want to encourage you as well, as our family, to imagine and dream with us. See, God, Lord, how do you want to use us as the Crossroads family? And so I wanted to share with you some things just about where we've been, where we're going. If you're new with us today, you're going to get kind of a, an under-the-hood look at Crossroads, kind of a family meeting style stuff. And if you're here with us always, you're going to be blessed because I, I want everyone to understand all the same things. Everyone hear the, all the same things so everybody knows exactly what's going on. Now, first, I want to say once again the church mission. So if you notice, it's going to pop up on the screen our mission as a church is simply responding to Jesus. That's our mission. We just want to simply respond to Jesus. And that's just not like a, a cool four-word church mission. I believe that's the Christian life in four words. 
that each one of us are learning how to simply respond to Jesus. Jesus says, I want you to do this. I want you to stop doing that. Hey, I want you to start doing that. Hey, I want you to do this and that. And all through our days, our lives should be in constant contact with Jesus as we seek to simply respond to him. And we do that in a little bit more amplified manner with our vision statement. And you guys have heard this. It's over the the doors. It's deep into who we are. Our vision statement is, of course, that we... Because Jesus is real, we're a family of faith, fully engaged, transforming our community and our world. Because Jesus is real, we are becoming a family of faith. And as this family of faith, all of us are engaged in the the work of the family for the work of transforming our community and our world. And really, everything that we do as a church gets filtered through that before we start doing it. Does it? show that Jesus is real? Does it promote us as a family with everybody involved? And are we seeking as God is transforming us to be a transformational agent locally and globally? Now, as I was thinking about that, I started thinking about Psalm 27. And I just wanted to read you just a few verses out of Psalm 27 that I think are really relevant for us as a family. So if you want, you can open up in your Bibles there. And if you're a, a If you're on Twitter and all that stuff, our hashtag for today is hashtag CCC for Crossroads Community Church and then I heart for, I heart for. And it says in Psalm 27, verse one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then in in verse four, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And then in verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. You know, these words in this psalm, this song, grip my heart because King David is struggling. If you read the whole psalm, you find that there's trouble on every side, but yet he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And we're reminded that we live in perilous times. David knew it. Every generation knows it. But because the Lord is our light, because he is our strength, our faith fixes our fears. And then he goes on to say, in the midst of all these troubles, he says, one thing I have asked One thing I desire, that I may dwell in God's house all the days of my life, that I may behold his beauty and inquire at his temple. See, in all of David's struggles, what he really wanted was to be part of the family of God, to be in the house of God. That as he was looking at all the issues of his kingdom and his life, he's saying, God, I just want to be where your people are. And I want to behold your beauty in the midst of a people. And what a beautiful reality for what church is meant to be. That we say, God, you are my light, my salvation, the strength of my life. And I just want to behold your beauty in your house with your people. So to give you the things that we have a heart for as a church. First, we have a heart for God. We have a heart for God. And it almost goes without saying, but you need to say it from time to time, that we have a heart for God. And the beauty is, is we have a heart for God because God first has a heart for us. So it says in the Bible that we love God because God first loved us. And so our worship as a church is not we need to figure out how to worship. It's no, we need to experience God's and God's love and his compassion and his grace for us. And we just turn it back to him. See, God loves you more radically than we could ever return the love for God. 
But as a church, we exist because God loves his people. And God isn't finished with us yet. And so we have a heart for God. And that's why we have the responding CD. Because we as a congregation, we're seeking to say, God, we want to write songs and use the art and the artistic abilities that you've given us to express our experience of understanding your heart and returning your heart back to you. And so one of the other things I've been so excited about here at Crossroads is we've been praying for a while that God would make Crossroads a house of prayer. Because before we can ever bless our community, we need to first bless our Lord and Savior. And so it's beautiful as we've been taking one Wednesday night out of every month, we've been gathering for worship and prayer as we had seven days of prayer and fasting. And on a Monday night, we were in the chapel. And it's amazing to watch how God is birthing a new passion for prayer in our midst. There's faithful prayer folks who pray here at Crossroads every Wednesday in the morning. We pray before all of our gatherings. And it's a beautiful thing because we are ministering unto the Lord. So we have a heart for God. And my hope is that the responding CD is the first of many CDs of all different styles. We've been talking about doing kids' worship doing all different types of things because God has given us and blessed us with this studio. And we're like, Lord, we want to use that thing for ministry. We want to change the world through the arts. And the responding is a big piece of that. So first, we have a heart for God. Second, we have a heart for the house. We have a heart for the house. Now, because Jesus is real, we have a heart for God. And because Jesus is real and we have a heart for God, then we are a family of faith. Now, when you think about that, for Thanksgiving, if you have a family, you gather with family where? In a house. Maybe it's an apartment. Maybe it's a townhouse. Maybe maybe you dig being free and clear from a foundation. So you have a a third wheel or a tractor trailer or whatever that you meet your family in. But families congregate in a location. And so I wanted to share just real briefly, because we're a family of faith fully engaged. I want to give you a little update on like kind of the state of the house, so to speak. And I want to talk about buildings and budgets. Now, not normal Sunday morning discussion, but we want to make sure everybody hears the same thing. And listen, it's not the church's building or the church's budget. It is our building and it is our budget. Why? Because we're a family. So first, on the buildings. It's been amazing to see in this year of stabilization how God has been working here on our campus. At this juncture, if you notice, our administrative building, the adjacent building, um, now we're starting to work on the exterior of it. If you were here in uh, March and April, we started talking about the absolute need to redo the roof, all the HVAC. We had leaky skylights. The exterior was falling off the building. We needed to redo the parking lot. And through the generosity of all of us, at this point, we all... Lord willing, have completed the project by the end of the year, and we're within about $95,000 of fully funding the Building Fund project. Praise God. You can clap for that. It's amazing. We've raised over and above our general fund almost a half million dollars to do that entire building. It's amazing. And so, please, through the end of the year, we're asking you to continue to give over and above your, your normal generosity to the building fund. It would be a testimony to God's grace for us to fully fund that project, to have that entire building, roof, everything, totally completed with, with the, the pavement in our parking lot done. They were critical needs for us. Now, so that's the first thing. Now, the second thing, of course, is, is, our, is our campus debt. And we've talked about that. And I ask the, that those of you who are passionate about seeing us eliminate our campus debt, which I am one of those people. I said, because the need on that building was so critical, instead of your normal over and above your general fund giving to the the debt free and three to do it to the building fund, I want to ask you through the end of the year to focus on the building fund. Come January 1, we're going to stop the building fund and all of our focus is going to be back on debt free and three. Every single penny that gets given to the church, which says debt free and three in the memo, that goes to make an extra payment on our campus debt. I'm here to tell you that in the last two years, in the last two years, we've paid off almost a million dollars of our campus debt. Praise God. Huge, huge strides we've made. And so, 
Every, listen, we don't use debt free and three to pay the mortgage. We budget for that. Every single penny over and above, we make an extra payment. And we're, we really believe God wants us to completely eliminate our campus debt just to be completely out of it so we can take all those funds and push it into the work of ministry. So, so we have the debt free in three, we have the building fund, and then you'll notice around the campus, there's a lot of refreshing going on, which if you own a house, if you, you do that, right? Time goes by, you gotta start refreshing things. We've been doing refreshing here in our sanctuary. You'll be noticing refreshing going on in the family room. It's beautiful to watch how God has been laying on people's hearts to, to just be a part of the refreshing process. Because we've been doing the administrative building, come January, you're gonna see brand new carpet in there because God laid it on someone's heart to say, I wanna just donate the carpet for the refresh there. You're gonna notice this month that you're gonna see uh, reclaimed wood going up in the family room and new TVs. Why? Because a group of people got together and said, we wanna buy the church new TVs for the family room. And I have a million stories like that of people just saying, this is our house. And because it's my house, I wanna be a part of this and I wanna get involved and how can I help? And we say, hey, there's this thing we can do or this thing we can do. And that's a continual thing. And that's just over above the normal stuff. In our budget, and if you guys know, and I'll move to the budgets now, if you guys aren't on a budget for your family, pastoral advice, get on a budget. It's, you need to be able to say, this is what we have coming in and this is what we have going out. And in our budget, we've been really passionate about honoring God with the stewardship of every single nickel in this place. And so in 2015, We've budgeted for a lot of projects as well. Our building services is called 2015, the year of the bathroom. <laughs> because literally, I mean, it's, it's all not that glamorous, but a lot of the bathrooms, we need to redo a lot of the bathrooms. If you notice the, the bathroom, and I'll actually, I'm not gonna tell you that because you'll notice it after it. But we got work to do on the bathrooms and we've budgeted in our budget all sorts. We need to fix bathrooms. We need to do this. We need to do that. But I'm here to tell you that for 2014, we're, we have three quarters that are done so far. We've been in the block every single quarter as a church. Praise God for that. Now, because of the giving to the building fund, our income didn't reach our projections, but you guys know that if you're on a budget and your income is not reaching your projections, what do you do? You dial back your expenditures. That's how a budget works. And we've done that for three quarters so far. And, give, and seeing that... Giving is solid for the last month of the year. We expect to be in the block for all four quarters of 2014. And so please don't forget crossroads in your giving and your generosity and your year-end giving. Now, we set a 2015 budget very conservative. When we brought it to our board of directors, they were like, man, this is a great hyper-conservative budget. And we did that because we really believe, we really believe that it's unto the Lord, and we want to take care of our house. Now, one of the things that's beautiful about our newest budget is that we, because of all the infrastructure work that we've done, we are able to raise the expenditures on ministry from 2014 to 2015 by 11%. That's a huge step because we've been staffing differently. We've been staffing, I would say, smarter. So our staff costs have lowered. Our, because of all the infrastructure, our building costs are going down. And so all that money now is getting used for the work of the ministry. And my hope is that every single year I can come and tell you, listen, all of our other expenditures are going down and our ministry budgets are going up so that we can do more and more and more of the work of the ministry. But that's our budget as a church. And God has been using each and every one of us to be a part of that. For those of you who are giving as unto the Lord, thank you so much. Praise God. I know you do it unto the Lord and the Crossroads family in our community gets the benefit, but thank you. And for those of you who are maybe praying about taking those steps, all I can tell you is you can never outgive God. That's what I've learned in my life. You can never outgive the Lord. And so step into God's work and what he's doing because not only do we have a heart for God and we have a heart for our house, but we have a heart for the church. We have a heart for the church. This is our discipleship. Crossroads is our local family our local expression. And I'm here to tell you, within the ministries of Crossroads, God has just been doing crazy, crazy, crazy things. Let me just share a few quick things with you. First, from, from an attendance stand, standpoint, between 2013, or between 2012 and 2013, 
Crossroads in its just a, its attendance grew by a double digit percentage point. So we grew by about between 15 and 20 percent between calendar year 2012 and calendar year 2013. Now at this juncture, we still have a couple weeks left, but Crossroads has grown again by double digit percentage points between 2013 and 2014, which means that between 2012 and the end of 2014, Crossroads has grown by about 35% just in people attending. And that doesn't include the fact that student ministries has tripled in size, family ministries has doubled in size, we have more engagement all around. And I share numbers with you because numbers are people, and Jesus died to save people. And it's amazing when you hear that as a church, we've grown by double digit percentage points the last two years. That's amazing. That's a testimony to what God is doing as we are the family of God and as we follow and simply respond to Jesus. And so one of the things that I wanna tell you is that we are absolutely committed to the ministries that we do here at Crossroads, that they be done excellently, they be done unto God's glory and they line up with our mission, vision, and values. We spend a lot of time with our pastors and our leaders investing to make sure that everything that we do, that if someone chooses to connect to Crossroads there, that it, it will accomplish the things that we desire it to. There's nothing worse than having a ministry for students that students don't want to go to or having a ministry for men that men don't want to go to. And so we are constantly, because we're moving into this year of imagination, we're constantly looking, how can we do this better? How can we do this more excellently? How can we make sure that we're scratching people's itches, so to speak, so that they can be discipled, that no matter where you connect at Crossroads, you're going to be built up and discipled. And it's absolutely exciting how God is moving in all the ministries of Crossroads. And another area that's really exciting is that we also realize that Crossroads is also part of Church with the Big C. We don't only have a heart for our local congregation, but we have a heart for the body of Christ overall. God has given us a beautiful place within Clark County as a church that people look to and want to join with. We've done seven the last two years, and with the pastors and ministry leaders, we're finding new and exciting ways to, to work together because we realize that we love our Crossroads family, but we're part of a bigger family. Just like you love your family, but you're also part of Clark County, and you're part of different bigger families. And we really believe in God's calling to Crossroads to be a resourcing church for the body of Christ. And God has given us a lot of beautiful opportunities to resource the body of Christ. The responding worship album, that's one of them. We've broken up our worship team into teams. Instead of having just one big group, we have different teams. Why? Because churches have been calling saying, hey, can you, we need help with worship. We want to be able to send a worship team over there and bless another church. We get calls all the time where people are like, hey, Pastor Daniel, do you have, I want to go on vacation. Do you have a pastor you can send over to preach? We really believe that God has given us a great opportunity to be part of God's work through the universal church. This upcoming week, I have two different meetings with some of our leaders, with pastors from other churches who want to learn, say, hey, can you help us understand this or that? And I always say, look, not that we're doing everything great, but, you know, there's things that we understand and there's things that we're growing in. And, you know, with Pastor Bill and my transition for us as a church, how many people have called and talked through transition with Pastor Bill or myself and asked ideas, hey, we're gonna start transitioning our church and God bless the Crossroads transition so profoundly. And we're seeking to be a resourcing church for the body of Christ. We wanna help other churches win, why? Because if one church wins, we all win because we're part of the church, amen? And God is, and we have a big heart for the body of Christ at large, church with a big C. So we have a heart for God, which speaks to our worship. We have a heart for the house, which speaks to our family and our community. We have a heart for the church, both the crossroads, local church, and church with a big C. And finally, we have a heart for the lost. We have a heart for the lost. Now, why do we have a heart for the lost? Because if you're here today and you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you realize that at one point you were lost too. None of us was born found. 
All of us were lost. We realized that we were lost. Jesus grabbed hold of our hearts. And Jesus does not make bad people good. Jesus makes dead people alive. And you've experienced that. And I've experienced that. And we are tirelessly, passionately committed to making sure until the whole world hears that Jesus makes dead people alive. And God has been using Crossroads in some pretty profound and amazing ways. I'll give you some numbers. Baptisms. 2011, 2012, and 2013, we had about 100 people get baptized each year. 100 people a year, which is pretty amazing. This year, 168 people got baptized. Amen. We had 70 more people follow Jesus into the waters of baptism than the years before. Now, what's amazing is when you realize that the average church size in America is about 70 people. God is really using the Crossroads family to reach lost. Now, what about people who accepted Christ? Now, here in the sanctuary, in 2012, we had 100 and, about 150. In 2013, we had 243. And so far this year, before this weekend, we saw 267 people receive Jesus right here in the sanctuary. That's 267 flat-out parties in heaven at one person coming to repentance. And listen, I gave this message last night. Five people gave their life to Jesus on a vision weekend message. Now, you know that God is at work when God is doing that. Now, listen, I want to thank you as the Crossroads family that each and every week, you give us the extra 10 minutes to invite people to come and put their faith and trust in Jesus. I realize that for some of you who been walking with Jesus, you're like, oh man, I wanna go get my coffee, I wanna get a burger, I need to get to Costco before all the Crossroads folks gets there and all the other stuff you got going on. <laughs> but listen, listen, there's nothing that blesses me more when I, as a pastor, go to invite people to come to Jesus when I see so many of you bow your hearts and start praying. Because listen, listen, that moment, Jesus gives new life, but Jesus invites his people to be a part of the birthing process. And we birth new life together with Jesus as a family. It's not me, it's us and I know that when we, had, when we have babies, anybody who's in the, the, the delivery room or if you have a home birth, anyone who's there, they're there for a reason. And I'm here to tell you, every single time we gather, when the call to people receiving Jesus goes out, we're all here for a reason. So don't make a beeline to get out of the parking lot fast. You are supposed to be here to be a part of that process. We, the world, eternity needs us to engage in the work of that. And God is using it in a powerful way. And I realize that the reason people are coming to know Jesus here at Crossroads is because you and I are inviting our loved ones and our lost friends and our family members. And I want to commend you to keep doing that. Invite them. Say, this is, come, come check out what, this church. Come check it out. As Pastor Jason said, a woman got saved last night because she, somebody shared a two-minute message on Facebook. She decided to come. She gave her life to Jesus last night. We'll use whatever means necessary. But not only do we do and have a heart for the lost within our walls, we have a heart for the lost outside of our walls. Now, as I invite the responding to come back on out as we close out, this is what Love Now is all about. Love Now is us simply responding to Jesus as a church locally, nationally, and globally. And listen, God has been using Crossroads through Love Now in just crazy ways. I mean, God's gift to us of the Ogden neighborhood and the Ogden schools, God has opened up amazing doors there as we've been investing in the teachers. And not only what we do through Love Now, I mean, Next Step is doing a, a teacher's luncheon. Our recovery ministry did, has done all sorts of things for the parents there. And God has just opened up great doors for us to love on our own community. A lot of us miss church over the last week for the Thanksgiving. We don't judge you. God loves you, so do we. But we, we, we gave out the boxes for our Jesus at street level box drop. Man, 750 boxes went out the door. They're going to get filled up to bless Clark County foster care. 
two different crisis pregnancy centers because we are committed to justice for the unborn. Hotel ministries because the Jesus at street level story, the incarnation that we celebrate is all about them not having any room at the inn. And so we help people in all these different areas. Man, just like that, in one week, 750 boxes go out. They're all going to come back filled up. And we're going to love our community right where they are. I love with what God is doing now as we're starting the Embark classes, as Crossroads is embarking to pioneer and join new missionary activity. But amongst the Muslim people, Crossroads has a huge, long history of mission cross-culturally, and we're stepping into it, and we're just the way God has used Crossroads to pioneer works, works like now what we're doing in Mexico. Now we go down, and we support, and we love this work that God has done, that now those churches don't need us to, to do the work. Now we come alongside them as they're already doing the work. We're saying, God, we want to step into what you're doing, because we want to look back in 25, 35 years and say, what God has done amongst the Muslim people, because we simply took a step of faith with you, Lord. I was told that over 100 people signed up for those Embark classes that are starting in January. That's a first step for us. Many of you told me, I'm praying. I'm praying for this country. I'm praying for this country. I'm praying for my heart for the Muslim people. And I believe that that is God's heart, a heart for the lost. And I'm here to tell you, somebody asked me, Pastor Daniel, what's our church growth strategy? I'm like, man, our strategy is to reach the lost. There's enough churches that want to reach other Christian people. And you know what I found? When you catch fish that have already been caught, they got holes in their lips. They got hooked here and all this stuff. And it's all, they're kind of mangled. They've been filleted five different ways. Now, I'm not knocking it because God's not finished with us yet. Amen. We all got some of those holes. But listen, my Bible tells me that the fields are white with harvest and the laborers are few and that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And when we hear that, we look at Clark County and the Portland metro area and we look at this globe and we say, Lord, there are more people outside the people of God than are inside. So we're gonna go deep sea fishing. We're adventurers that way. We got the heavy line and the big rod and we're saying, Lord, we wanna go catch not the little fish that were farm raised, but we wanna catch the big honkers and as a church we are radically committed to reaching out to people who have yet to hear the gospel and we will use whatever means necessary to reach them locally nationally and globally we want to reach by the power of the spirit our own Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth my friends listen What God is doing in Crossroads is a testimony that Jesus is real. It's a testimony. And my friends, I believe the best is yet to come. Not because there was anything wrong with the past, but because when Jesus returns, we're gonna step into the fulfillment. And so until he comes back, we can always say, it's been awesome, but the best is yet to come. And I believe that God wants to partner with his people to do great and mighty things that no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered into someone's heart. God's just looking for people who say, God, we're available. We're in. We're in. And I'm here to tell you, as a Crossroads family, we are so far. And we put all our chips in. We're all in. We're like, okay, Lord, let's just do this. So listen, thank you for being a part of the Crossroads family. And as we step into this new year, make another step by getting deeper into the family, being part of the ministry here, that you could be blessed and be a blessing. And listen, if you're here and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, in a moment I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to put your faith and trust, because I believe that God brought you here. You needed to be here today as we spent more time in worship, as we shared about our family. I believe there's many of you, God is like, oh yeah, you're supposed to be part of the family. You're supposed to put your faith and trust in Jesus. You're supposed to have your sins forgiven and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And deep down in the pit of who you are, you're like, I want that. I want to experience that Jesus is real. And I want to be part of a family of faith who's fully engaged. And I want God to transform me that I can be part of the solution in this world and not part of the problem. And if that's you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to take that step in just a moment. 
before today. Let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray. Father, we thank you so much.